everybody, welcome to a very special episode of Cash Out with the Coaches, brought to you, as always, by our incredible partners at Sports Pub Media. I am the coach, he is Travis Fulton, and Trav, this is our Open Championship Preview, the final major of the year. Certainly, we're not even close to the end of the golf season, but for the major season, this is the end. And for the next 30 to 45 minutes, we're going to kind of break everything down, storylines, favorites, sleepers. We're going back to Royal St. George's, and there's a lot to dive into this week here on our Open Preview. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. Um, you know, it's the Open Championship. It's uh, it's probably the hardest to handicap for, for a lot of mm-hmm. us because, you know, we don't we don't have the familiarity uh, with the golf courses, of course, as much as we do here, working on the rotation. Uh, this time, Royal St. George, we saw it back in uh, 2011, Darren Clark won uh, at minus five, and then Ben Curtis, a uh, surprising finish wow. back in 2003. He won at one under, and you may recall Tiger was right there in the hunt. They showed that on Golf Channel, which was fun to watch uh, back in 2003. So. You start looking at those winners, you go all the way back to Greg Norman, Sandy Lyle, Bill Rogers, Bobby Locke. I mean, these are the names that have won at Royal St. George. So I, I love watching link style golf. Um, and, you know, it's such a different kind of golf than what we're used to here in the United States. A lot of the big name players are over there the week before to play in the Scottish Open to get familiar with some of the golf over there to get on um, the right timetable. So they're all ready to go. So I'm excited. I love watching it. And um, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be a really good championship. Yeah. A little bit of information for people at home. This will be the 15th time that Royal St. George's has hosted the open championship. Um, More than two dozen former major champions, more than a dozen former world number one. Uh, This is really when you, part of the reason I love the open championship so much is that they do something that other tournaments don't do. Everybody tees off from number one. So you've got like 13 to 15 hours of golf from like 6 a.m. local time, which is what, one or two back here. And you get up in the middle of the night. I know you do it. I do it. And you're watching all day. And it's the best. It is the best. It's back at NBC now. They also show the Scottish Open the week before on NBC. So they really lock and load for two weeks. But I think it's so different, Trav that for fans of golf, and there's not a lot of new fans this year now with COVID, that they're going to see a style of golf that not everybody, famously Bubba Watson is like, I'll probably never win this championship. Phil Mickelson said it before he got it done. Uh, It's a different style of golf that either you buy all the way in or there's really no point in thinking you're going to win if you're not all in on how this style uh, works. Kind of explain to the people at home before we get into our storylines, kind of what, when you talk about links and the Open Championship, and all of these different courses that they play on, what kind of a player is able to do well and be successful? <laughs> well, I mean, you've got you've to avoid the big numbers, of course, right? And, and the sight lines off of the tee are, are so important in how aggressive um, you're going to play, avoiding bunkers and mm-hmm. things like that. I think there's going to be a lot that goes into when they're there um, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and how they're going to play each hole and where they're going to take their tee balls. And then, of course, from there into the greens. You've got to be hitting greens. Uh, I think greens regulation, I think, is key. You go back to Darren Clark and Ben Curtis. I think that's a key stat. Um, you know, this is going to be probably a minus four, minus five type of open championship wow. in comparison to say to what we saw last year or two years ago, I should say was Shane Lowry that ran it up into the team. So, um, so I think it's, 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 it's not a complete U S open mentality, right? I think you'll probably see um, a few more birdies than that, but you've got to, you got to have your sidelines off the tee. I think you've got to be comfortable into the center of the greens, greens and regulation, um, make your solid pars, take your chances when you can. Um, But this is a good test. I think someone said I was reading it's the, the fairest test perhaps of all of the courses. I'm not sure what that exactly means, Um, but you know, there's going to be a lot, especially from the American players going into it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, what is their game plan in playing each one of these holes? Because again, it's a different kind of golf than what they're used to. 
Well, you bring up the the bunkers, and for those people who are not familiar with Lynx Golf, there's not water, there's not a lot of out of bounds. So how you get penalty strokes is by hitting it into these fairway bunkers that a lot of times are so deep, or they're pot bunkers that all you can do is just chip out, and there's your stroke penalty. That's kind of the difference uh, between Lynx Golf and 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 how they they defense the course. This is a betting show. So let's take a look at the betting favorites for the week. And John Rahm, as you would expect, he's your reigning U.S. Open champion. He is your betting favorite at 9-1. to one. But then there's a couple others. Dustin Roy right there at 11, then Brooks at 14. What do you make of – there's only, I believe I wrote down, uh, seven or eight total golfers that are 20-1 to one or below. And we just saw those names right there. What do you make of some of the, uh, of some of the numbers you've seen so far? Well, I, I think it, it makes sense. I mean, Rom is the number one player in the world. There's no question about it. What he did at Memorial um, and then how it went down on Sunday. I mean, he was blitzing the field. Then he comes back and he wins the U.S. Open in, in terrific fashion, birding the last two holes. He is, he is the most complete player, as I would put it right now. He drives the ball exceptional. Um, he's a solid iron player. He's going to hit a lot of greens. His short game is clean. His putting is clean. You know, you think of a Darren Clark, it's kind of John Rahm, isn't it? I mean, there's, you know, there's, I think there's some similarities there mm -hmm. uh, in the way that they go about their game. I think Rahm is a better player than Clark. I think he's a better putter than, than, than Darren Clark. But I think from a ball striking standpoint, Darren Clark is very pure. I mean, he can stripe it and hit a lot of green. So I think Rahm is the safest bet. There's no question. Still questions with DJ, you know, where's he at? Rory's still kind of working through some things, although he looked fairly decent um, at the U.S. Open. You know, you go down the list, I would say the second safest might be a Brooks Kepka um, and a Xander Shoffley. I think there's a lot of concern with Bryson we'll get into later, but uh, Rom's the most complete player. There's no question. Yeah, right now, I mean, he, he's coming in with an unbelievable uh, confidence. Uh, he's probably still hung over. From all the different videos I saw and all the different ways that he was drinking uh, around the U.S. Open trophy. Uh, but uh, like a lot of U.S. Open champions, he has not played since the U.S. Open. And uh, so he'll be fresh. He'll be ready to go. Um, so I, I kind of like his his chances this week. And I like the fact that he's coming in with so much confidence. Uh, and we'll get into ROM, too. So here's what we're going to do. We usually do uh, two storylines each. Uh, you have some? Oh, okay. Two favorites each. And then we do two sleepers. Well, I was just going to say real well. quick. Yeah, so so Rom is playing in the Scottish Open. Um, this oh, week. I know. I'm, I'm saying so he, he, is, he hasn't played since, but he is this week. Yeah. But, well, yeah. that's what I meant. Yeah. yeah. He's, so you got yeah, Rom, you got Xander, you got more Justin, Kala, Rory, JT, Hatton. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah I, saw somebody, I saw somebody on social media complained about the field at the Scottish Open. And uh, Jason Sobel tweeted back like 15 of the biggest names in the world. They're like, what else do you want? Which I thought was pretty funny. Uh, all right, let's jump into the storylines that we're going to be. Uh, we're, it was crazy. It was crazy. Uh, let's jump into the storylines that uh, we're going to be keeping an eye on as we get to Royal St. George's uh, next week. And of course, we got to start with the two men, and really one of them will not let this thing go. When Bryson parted with his caddy, Brooks sent out on social media, diabolical. As he said, is what National Caddies Appreciation Day? Couldn't do without my best friend on my back. It was next level trolling. But <laughs> exactly, dropping the elbow. I got to tell you, brother. So, uh, what do you make of where we are with Bryson and Brooks as we head to yet another major? You know, I think it's it's clearly um, it's clearly affected Bryson more than Brooks. You know, there's yeah. there's no question about that. You know, Brooks has made it personal. Bryson, I, I think, is trying to play it off the best that he can. Um, but it's affected Bryson's play. You know, Bryson hasn't looked good, really, at all. I mean, the driver is, I, I think he's slowed down a little bit. Um, his approach game hasn't been good. His short game is is just awful. You know, awful. his touch and feel yeah. is, is just not good. Now, you know, last week, Tim Tucker leaves him suddenly you know, right there before they tee off in Detroit. Um, you know, there's just, there's a lot going on there. Um, so he, he certainly is a storyline as Bryson has been now for the last couple of years. 
in everything that he's doing, even before the Brooks Kepka saga, who is playing some pretty good golf. It's a major championship. Um, you know, we know Brooks will get up for this. I think he's hitting the ball pretty well. He reunited with his putting coach, Jeff Pierce, which I think he needed to do. I think he needed to get back to some of the things that he was doing with his putter. He looks much better, much more confident from that perspective. So, you know, the storyline, Bryson Brooks, it's out there. It's one of the biggest ones. And right now, Brooks on the golf course is certainly get the better hand over Bryson because Bryson's got just a lot of question marks right now in his game and his caddy, which is going to be, it's going to be interesting to see what he does when he gets over there. Does he use a local caddy perhaps? It, it, he certainly slowed down at the rocket mortgage. He was, he was walking off the yardages himself instead of what his caddy would normally do. Uh, Brooks is an alpha and alphas figure out a way to always stay on top. And he continues to troll Bryson but I think he's got a switch in his brain that when he gets to big events like this, nothing bothers him. I don't know that Bryson has that switch. And when things bother Bryson, it manifests itself on the course. And we're starting to see that. After every bad shot in Detroit, it was like, I suck. I stink. This is terrible. How do and the self-talk was awful. And I think he's going to struggle even more at the Open Championship because it's so different than what they play on a weekly basis. So I think Brooks... Uh, is somebody that we can look at. I think Bryson arguably could miss the cut, you know, at the open if he doesn't figure things out and get a caddy that knows Link's golf. You got to have a caddy that knows it or has been there before, has been there before. Uh, all right, my, my first storyline that I want to look at this week, and it's going to be talked about a lot on the broadcast, and I'm a little, not shocked, but a little disappointed in how – uh, they're treating the players as opposed to the fans. And a lot of players, Trav, they said because of the ridiculous COVID restrictions, they almost decided not to go. So I'm looking this up. They're allowing 32,000 fans a day. The max is normally 40. So they're almost to full capacity. But yet the players, the players can only stay four to a house. You can't have their managers. They can't have their agents. Nobody. If they fly over on a plane and there's somebody on the plane that sits near them that gets COVID or contra, it's then they're disqualified, no questions asked, even if they've been vaccinated. So some of these rules are absolutely ridiculous. Multiple players, multiple caddies are not permitted to share private self-accommodations, which means normally they get these big houses and multiple players stay together for you might have 10, 12, 20 people in the house. Not allowed this year. So now they have to change everything. You got to get a private chef or have somebody do your, your uh, shopping for food for you. Bring it in. They are not allowed to go to a restaurant. Period. End of story. If they're seen at a restaurant, disqualified. When I read some of these um, restrictions and protocols, I understood why guys like Ricky Fowler and other players are saying, you know what, is it really worth it? But then at the end of the day, you've got to remember, Trav, this is a major championship. And there are so only so many that you are able to play in as a professional. And to skip one over protocols, I think would be a little short-sighted. And it's good to see that all the big names are planning to show up. Yeah, that's that that was well summed up on your on your behalf. And I, I agree, you know, with all of it. You, you try to look at the other side, the RNA and the USGA and, you know, the PGA Tour and like, you know, these companies, they, you know, I, I would have to think are hemorrhaging money over the last year and they need fans. Yeah. And so, you know, perhaps there's some desperation here, you know, um, from their behalf. But it, it does seem like they've went a little too far with um, some of the things that are happening here, someone sitting, you know, two seats from you and they had it and yet you, know, you test, right? You, you know, it's like, that doesn't make sense. So they, I think they probably went a little too far, um, from this standpoint, but I, I, I just, you know, you hope that everybody gets there once they're there, it's all business, right? I think yep. they'll, they'll focus in, get on the golf course. All right. I can't go eat in a restaurant. It's going to be all business. I think things will smooth out once they're on site, off they go. I saw one player uh, quoted as saying they're more worried about fans buying beers to make up the money, that, which you just alluded to, than they are about the players who are playing the event, which are the reason the fans are coming to the event in the first place. 
And so I understand both sides of it. I really, yeah. really do. So many people and places and businesses lost tons of money. Every year, the RNA is, is making millions, tens of millions off the Open Championship. And when you have a year that that doesn't happen, yeah, certainly there's hemorrhaging money. But you got to be, to me, you got to be a little looser. But it is, we're, we're still going to enjoy it. We don't have to go over there. It is what it is. All right. What is your second storyline that you're looking at for the Open Championship? You know, I, I'm going to go with an American here, another one, Xander Shoffley, um, as a storyline. People who are close to the game, they know that the clock is ticking here for Xander. And, and he is, no question, the best player without a major championship. And and John Rom winning one, I think he was the best player without mm-hmm, a major championship. Mm-hmm. Now he has one. And now I think the spotlight is solely on Xander. You know, of course, DJ's number two in the world. He's got him. JT has one. Morikawa has one. And then there's Xander at five. Then you go to six. Um, you got Bryson. He's got one. Brooks, check. Yep. Um, and then Cantley, you have to go all the way down to number eight, who doesn't have one. But Patrick Reed at nine does. So, you know, you can see Xander, I think, is definitely the better player over Cantley. He's the guy now. The spotlight's on him. And, and people... You know, his peers tout him as a excellent player. We know he he has the game, the complete game, to get in the hunt. The question becomes, late on a Sunday, can he get the job done and not fade away, not hit the ball in the water at the Masters on the 16th, not fade away in your hometown on a Sunday uh, in San Diego at the U.S. Open. So I love Xander Shoffley, love his game. I would love to see him win a major championship. But um, I'm not worried, Coach, about Thursday through Saturday. I'm worried late Sunday afternoon, or should I say Sunday morning <laughs> this week at the Open Championship, because he, you know, he's played okay at the Open. He was he was tied for second back in 18, so he's got the complete game to make this work. Um, but pressure's on, man. I think it's the time is is now for his career. He's in his prime to get this done. Well, maybe there's a little less pressure now because he posted pictures last week. And young Xander just got married to the love of his life. It was kind of funny because he posted a picture, and by the way, he outkicked his coverage something fierce. And he posted a picture with her and their two dogs, and the caption was, my best friend, my wife, heart. And people were like, which one's your best friend, the dog or the wife? Because we're not quite sure. And I thought that was kind of funny. But the wedding is now out of the way. So now he can be laser-focused on getting his game to where it needs to be. And we've seen some of these young cats that have gotten married, Spieth, now Xander, Rom, they're all starting to start families and having babies. And, and, and it's a big transition in life to go from you're by yourself and it's all about you to now you got to travel the family, do all that. So how will Xander handle that? He doesn't have a baby yet, but, but everything else he does now have. So uh, there is a lot of focus on him. And and I hope he can break through because he is a lot of fun to watch. And I got to stop betting against him because it's costing me money every time. Uh, seemingly that I do. Seemingly that I do. Uh, my storyline that I want to hit on is, is it going to be a big game hunter winning the Open Championship? Or is it going to be one of the other ones? These are winners, just winners, Trav, in 2021 on the PGA Tour. Just winners. Cameron Davis. Harris English, Kevin Na, Siwoo Kim, Max Homa, Daniel Berger, Brandon Grace, Matt Jones, Billy Horschel, Joel Damon, Stuart Sink, Sam Burns, K.H. Lee, Jason Kograk, Garrett Higo, your boy. Those are just some of the winners. This year, is it going to be one of them? Or is it going to be a Rom or a Rory or a DJ? I'm, I'm really interested to keep an eye on this storyline to see who's going to be the next guy if it's not Xander. Is it going to be one of these younger cats that now is able to play in all these majors and break through? I think it's going to be interesting to see who can get to the top and if when they do, if they can finish on Sunday. Well, I think I think um, you know all those na- all those names that you mentioned, deservedly so on the PGA Tour, you win. But you know we see courses that are very different than major championship courses, and you can get away and you can hide one of your weaknesses right mm-hmm. like there's a lot of courses on tour we're short game like we're short I mean, game yeah you got to have a short game maybe to make the cut but we're talking to win if you're depending on your short game in detroit 
if you're depending on your short game this week in Moline, Illinois, at the John Deere, you got issues, right? Like you, you can kind of get a, around some weaknesses here and there. I still think and win on the PGA Tour. I think in, in majors, you got to have it all. Mm-hmm. Um, but and you look at the winners this year, like, okay, Hideki, that's a big name at the Masters. Phil, big name at the PGA. John Rahm, big name at the U.S. Open. So I, I'm expecting probably more of the latter, the bigger name. Um, I could, I, I like the idea of the ROM. I like the idea of Brooks, Xander. Um, we'll get to Hovland here in a second. I'm thinking down in the 30, 35 to one range, um, is kind of where it's going to be versus say a name like a Matt Jones, but there's some young guys like a Guido, some guys that, mm-hmm. um, that are over there on the European tour, um, that are going to be playing that know that kind of, that, that know that kind of golf that we maybe are overlooking and are probably overlooking um, that will certainly run up that leaderboard a little bit. Certainly like a Martin Keimer is a guy that we'll get to who's playing very good golf coming in under the radar um, that has some big odds on him. And I, I, why couldn't he win another major championship? He's got two of them for crying out loud. There is no reason why he, he cannot, but let's talk about some of the players. Uh, now let's go to our favorites first. And obviously right at the top, we got to start with the number one player in the world who is the U.S. Open champion, and there's nobody playing better than this cat, your guy, John Rahm. Yeah, I mean, he is. He's he's the most complete player. He deserves to be the favorite. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of question marks. There's been a lot of question marks for a lot of the bigger names this mm-hmm. year. It seems like going in as we've broken down every single week, um, you know, where's DJ at? You know, he seems a little bit not as focused as – as he was there at the end of last year, he's shown signs a little bit as of late Rory, of course, um, has taken on a few swing changes. Um, and you know, we, we saw him really struggle early, but he's kind of picking up the pieces, but we, it seems a bit distant yet from the Rory that we know that can win major championships. Bryson, we talked about that. JT has been a little erratic. Um, you know, can speed do enough with the driver? So it's like, you know, there's these question marks around these bigger names. And here's Rom, who I think has now settled in. Number one player in the world. He looks comfortable in that the game is on full go. There's no weaknesses. I just kind of look at what Darren Clark did. I, I think Rom could come in and do the exact same thing and win this tournament at a four, five, six under, just like he did the U.S. Open. Yeah, and I think the sports books would love that because they always want the favorite to win because most people don't bet on the favorite because the number is too short. So John Rahm is what everybody wants to win and everything you just said. I don't need to add anything to what you just said because sometimes it's as simple as that, and it's as simple as that. Uh, my guy that I'm going to keep an eye on, and I'm still uh, efforting to be his publicist and to really help him with the entertaining side of things, but his game is as good as anybody's right now. And I'm talking about Patrick Cantlay. And we all know, we all know how much it drives me crazy when he plays well on the PGA Tour because he just doesn't seem to enjoy it. And Jack Nicholas has got on record as saying, I've told him, loosen up, have fun. And he never seems to. But I don't care if he has fun. I don't care if he shows me. I care if he plays well this week. And I think with two wins this year, the Zozo, and then he won at the Memorial. Um, and whether or not you count that with an asterisk, it doesn't matter. It's on his record. And I think he could go over with his short game, the way he puts, and the way that nothing else seems to bother him. I think the COVID restrictions will help a guy like him because he's not a social butterfly anyway. So I'm keeping my eye this week on a Patrick Cantlay to potentially get his first major win. Yeah, that would be something, wouldn't it? You know, those are the two in the top 10 that you would point to in the official World Golf rankings that are not, you know, they don't have that signature win um, from a major championship. And Mm -hmm. it just feels like Cantlay is always pretty good in bad weather, too, doesn't it? He just kind of seems like he's done phase kind of muddled through some stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I like that. Uh, All right. Who's your uh, number two favorite? Uh, that always seems to show up, and maybe this is his time. Yeah, good big. I like it. Yeah, no, I'm saying your your second guy. All right, it could be <laughs> your oh, second guy, Victor sorry. Hovland. Sorry, <laughs> it's okay. My bad, Victor Hovland. <laughs> My second favorite. <laughs> 
Vic is, uh, what is he, 25 to 1? I think he's 25 to 1. He's right around uh, there. Right yeah. now. I'm not sure if that classifies as a favorite. <laughs> but, we'll, but we'll stretch it out. Everyone knows Hovland. He went over there. He won the BMW, um, the International Open there at the end of June, 19 under. Um, and look, I'm, I'm just... I'm kind of defaulting to I need a I need a fairways and greens kind of deal, right? And and Victor's always up there, like he's a he's he's like a ROM where it's like okay, I need to hit my driver in here, and then I need to hit my my iron on the green, and then I need to do it again, and then I need to do it again, and then I need to do it again, and, I, and that's like you know that's the kind of person that I'm that I'm leaning on here. Oh, and I missed it now, I got to get it up and down. And I think Victor's short game um, has shown growth. It, it, you can see it statistically. Especially in the month of May, he's been in the positive from a stroke scanning standpoint. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought he played well at Memorial, didn't putt well. Um, but we've seen some good stuff out of him this year. Wells Fargo, Balspar, he was third, WGC Mexico second. Like he's played some really classy golf. He's looked really like the elite ball striker. And now with the improving short game, I think the putter can be good enough. I like Hovland. I really do. I think Hovland could be very. I think Hovland could be very sneaky at a golf course um, like this, because also things don't bother him. The wind won't bother him. Uh, grinding doesn't bother him. Uh, you got to have the, the the right kind of mental makeup to play a major that is going to be in that minus three to minus seven range, which you know you got to grind and get up and down and everything you just said. So uh, I love Victor for this spot. The only hesitation I have is he just doesn't have a lot of experience playing Lynx golf. But you can't get experience until you go play. And he's certainly going to play next week. Now, a guy who does have experience in Lynx golf and has one of the most spectacular wins in the history of the Open Championship is my second favorite. And that, of course, is Jordan Spieth. And if I'm going to go to a course, Trav, that I need my short game, if I'm going to go to a course that's going to be minus five to win, if I'm going to go to a course that I need somebody who's tasted the 32,000 fans that have been there before and yell and scream and have to get out of the way and move, there's nobody that's been in the mix more or does it better than my guy Jordan Speak. And the only thing I don't like is the fact that he hasn't played a lot of golf since the PGA Championship. I don't like it. I think you have to at least play once or twice leading in. And he had many tournaments he could have played in, and he decided not to. And maybe it's to get ready for the Open Championship and the rest of the year, which is going to be very, very busy for a guy like him. But that's the only hesitation I have is his lack of play the last two months. That's it. It'd be a cool story, wouldn't it? Spieth goes over there and and gets a major championship. Um, it's funny how we haven't talked about Justin Thomas. Just, you know, we don't, we, we're at, we're at a point where we're trusting Spieth more than JT, perhaps, you know, over there in the open championship. Yeah. He knows how to get it done. There's no question about it. He's shown, he's shown growth. The swing looks, it's interesting looking, um, but it's, but it's, but it's working. So does it, does he travel over there and you get some wind hitting it and different kinds of shots? Does it kind of dismantle a little bit? I think, you know, um, we'll have to wait and see. But um, but let me ask like you a question. Let, let, yours, let, let me jump in. Let me ask you a question real quick. You bring up JT. Talk about Rory. All these big names. Now, they deserve for us not to be talking about them right now. Look at what they've done recently in major championships. What has JT done this year? Nothing. He's done nothing in major championships. So as great as he is and as many wins as he has, for, for us to talk about him or any of these other guys, you got to do something. And so far, you mentioned it. Hideki, uh, who were the other winners? Uh, uh, John Rahm, and then the PGA Championship was the, uh, Phil. So, so what else have these guys done? And, and they're not even making top tens. They're, you know, remember JT? He was missing a putt for the cut at the PGA Championship. So, um, you know, he, they don't deserve right now to have us talk about them. And that's okay. That's okay. All right, let's get into our sleepers for this week. This could be any name on the board that maybe people aren't really talking about that could show up and do some damage come the weekend. Your first name is who? I'm going to go to the 36-year-old Martin Keimer. I mean, oh, by the way, he's won two major championships. He's won the players. 11 wins in in Europe. 
His best wow. finish um, at the Open was was T7. But Kimer's playing good. He's playing. He's kind of got his game in a very nice spot again. He was 26 at the U.S. Open. He finished second mm-hmm. behind Hovland that I mentioned yep. um, at the BMW International. I like Martin Keimer. You know, he he's he's a bulldog man. When he gets his game right and he gets up there, you're going to have to beat him. You know, like he is a bulldog. He knows how to win. And um, you know, there's some. What kind of story would that be if Martin Keimer? Let's say wins this, which I think he can. And he's got three legs of a grand slam. Think about that. (laughs) Wow. I never really thought about that. You're right. He's won a U.S. Open. And he's he's won a a PGA. And he's won the players. Yeah. Wow. 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 And the players. He he would have a shot at 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 all five if you count the players. It'd be incredible, right? And and it's not a sleeper, right? We're going for a long shot. I'm going to give you some odds here with Keimer, but look, he's 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 playing some very sporty golf right now. Wouldn't be surprised to see Keimer up there um, going into the final day. I think it'd be an awesome story if he, if he was. It would be. And in that last round at the BMW, you shot, I believe, a 64 to vault into second place. So I, I really like that sleeper to keep an eye on. My first sleeper is a guy we've talked about who isn't happy with the protocols and that's Ricky Fowler because wives I didn't mention they're not allowed families I didn't mention they're not allowed can you imagine telling a player who routinely takes their entire family and team over there nope you're by yourself and just a couple of people so Fowler 10 years ago this was his second open championship ever and he played St. Andrews the year before and hadn't hit one bunker and then came here and hit his first bunker ever in an Open Championship. He had a top 10 here. He's had three top 10s in Open Championships. He's played in 10 straight. This will be his 11th. Um, And so I think because of his recent form, and in Detroit, he was tied for the lead on Saturday at one point. And he's starting to play better. He's hitting it better. He still has his hiccups. And and then on Sunday, he backed up just a little bit. Uh, But I like Fowler to maybe – a refocus he's only played in one of the three majors this year because he just hasn't qualified and he needed a special exemption just to play the pga and he had a top 10 there so uh i think ricky is is primed and ready to get back to you talk about a swing all the time when you really see why did you change well there's no reason to get back to that swing again and i think ricky's going to be somebody to keep an eye on if not to win to to really have a high finish at a place that he's played well at before yeah, I think it's a good pick. I think he's starting to piece it back together. His approach game's getting better. His putter has woken back up. Um, you know, I think his driver's still a little erratic, but I think he's definitely moving back to how Ricky used to play. And and he's Ricky's a very good win player. He's had a good track record in open championships. I, I think it's a good sleeper for sure. Yep. Yeah, he better get his game back too because uh, he just announced that his wife is pregnant and they're going to have a little baby girl. So we know in a few months – His life is going to be completely turned upside down again. All right, let's go to our final sleepers for the show. Who's your second name you're going to be keeping an eye on? Well, I'm going to go to um, a guy here, Terrell Hatton, who knows how to play in Europe. I think he's very solid um, over there. He's got six Euro wins, English player. Mm -hmm. We've seen him over here um, get the one PGA Tour win down at Arnie's Place, tough golf course. His best finish in the open, um, let's see, it was, well, 2016, he was fifth. And then he was sixth in 19 when Shane Lowry won, which I know you have a few things to say about him. Mm-hmm. But, you know, he's just, um, he can be a grinder. We know he kind of puts things on his sleeve, but he is he is that grinder kind of player. Um, you know, I think, his, I think his approach game is really good. I think he's good enough off the tee. I think he needs that putter coach to get back up to the level that we're used to seeing from him. Mm, I think his putter let him down a little bit. And perhaps going back over there, the putter wakes up and he matches that up with some good ball striking. Uh, I think Terrell Hatton can be a little bit of an under-the-radar type, type of guy, even though he's the 10th-ranked player in the world. It's, it's because we never think about him. And he continues to elevate. And I, I think it's because we, we just refer to him as, as entertaining. 
that he's fun when he messes up because of all the things that he says instead of how good he can be, right? How good he can be. Um, he definitely has the game to win a major. Does he have it up here to win a major? That's the big question about Terrell Hatton. But we will certainly keep our eye out for him. My second sleeper, and how do you have the defending champion be a sleeper? Well, you don't have the event a year ago. He's held it for almost two years. He's got to give back to the Clara Jug. But he's also got to find his game here again, too. Now, the last couple of months, he's had some good finishes. The Memorial T6, PGA Championship, a very quiet T4. U.S. Open, he did have a T65, which basically finished last after making um, after making the weekend. Uh, I think going back to the Open Championship is going to give him a lot of good vibes. Uh, but nobody is talking about Shane Lowry coming into this Open Championship. That's why I have him as uh, one of my sleepers, is that he can come in, feel no pressure that normally you do feel when you're the defending champion at a major because they haven't played it in two years. And I think that's going to benefit him. And I think that Shane Lowry could have a really, really good week if his putter is working because we know his iron play is dynamic when it is on. So I think Shane Lowry is somebody to keep an eye on as a defending champion. Yeah, I like it. I think Lowry's. I think Lowry's uh, is a is a really good pick. He he played really good at Memorial. His putter let him down at the Open, U.S. Open, but he played very good at Memorial and very good at the PGA. So, yeah, I mean, it 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 feels weird. I'm sure to go in and be the defending champion <laughs> yeah. from two years ago, but it does feel like probably some of that pressure perhaps has been decompressed, and he can just go in and free will it. That'd be that'd be a cool story. I think you know. For, for Lowry to go in there. I think Hatton and Lowry are, are two good sleeper picks. I think that as we wrap it up, we're going to have a full preview of the Open next week with all of our betting picks and all that good stuff as we always seem to do. But I think because of the fact, uh, as we close this preview, that they didn't have this last year and that there's going to be 32,000 fans per day, that this could be one of the best Opens we've ever seen because of the anticipation because of the players that are playing well, but also because of some of the players that we talked about that are new to Lynx Golf and to see how they're going to respond to playing at Royal St. George's. I'm really excited. I'm really looking forward to it. Any final thoughts here on the preview? I, I'm excited. I, you know, I think it's going to be great. You've got the, the Scottish Open, of course, this week over there, opposite of the John Deere. Um, big names over there. I, I think how they play there will obviously determine some odds going into the final week. So we'll kind of see how a JT, a Rory looks um, in the Scottish and then make our final picks for the show next week, which uh, I'm, I, I'll be fired up to do. Once again, from Northern Idaho, not my mom's basement this time. But oh, from you're, you're going to be out there for two lake. weeks. Oh, you're going to be yeah. out there for two weeks. Yes. Oh. oh. Run. Look at you. Look at first world problems. First world problems for my <laughs> man, Travis. Uh, all right. That's going to do it for our huge open preview. And for Samantha and Cody and our credible partners at Sports Pub Media, we'll be back with you a full betting preview next Tuesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern in our normal time slot. For Trav, I'm the coach. And remember, if you're going to cash out every week, why not cash out with the coaches? Good luck.